Concerning Stalin's activities around this time, Voroshilov said, quote, Between 1918 and 1920, Stalin was the only man whom the Central Committee kept sending from one front to another, to the point at which the revolution was in the greatest peril. Murphy When Trotsky became Commissar for War, there were only around 100,000 Red Guards, armed workers, and an army had to be created. On March 1, 1918, the Supreme War Council was created for this task, and Trotsky became its chairman on the 13th. With his inspiring oratory, he was able to help bring many people into the Red Army, though this was later aided by conscription. Among those he recruited were 30 to 40,000 officers from the Tsar's army, hoping that would make up for the lack of military training in the working class. He knew they might not be politically reliable, so political commissars were introduced to keep an eye on them. However, the army was thrown into battles before it could be trained. Trotsky had read about armies and revolutions, but didn't have military experience or experience organizing revolutionary warfare. From the time he was 19 in 1898, he had barely been in Russia until 1917, and had fought the Bolsheviks until joining in July 1917. According to Murphy, quote, The disagreement was fundamental and was never eliminated. It was now to appear again in quarrels with Stalin concerning the Red Army. Unquote. Murphy continued about Trotsky, quote, the fact is, he never really accepted the principle governing the relationship of Lenin's party with the masses because he was incapable of believing in the creative power of the proletariat. He was an egotist with all the overconfidence of the egotist. He was of the stuff of which dictators are made, and his conception of leadership had as its premise the recognition of his abilities, plus a proletariat which would do as he ordered. They had to be organized. He would organize them as part of a machine under the control of a staff drawn from the middle classes, the intelligentsia and the army officers, with himself at the head. He was efficient, he admired efficiency, but he could never surrender himself to the idea of integrating himself with the proletariat, or believe that the qualities he saw in the middle classes were latent in the proletariat also, and that the revolutionary struggle would bring the working classes into the ranks of leadership. They could be educated in the long run, he thought, but not in the short. His intellectual snobbery ruined him as a revolutionary." Unquote. Murphy did also write, quote, that he performed great feats of service as the Commissar for War is undeniable. Ibid. He noted the quick creation of the army and his, quote, tremendously inspiring effort in rousing the proletariat, unquote, for the 1919 defense of Petrograd. Ibid. However, he concluded, quote, but the nature of these triumphs is in keeping with the man. They were feats of emotional appeal and efficiency in dictatorial organization. Ibid. This may have sufficed if they were fighting a national war, but they were fighting a class war. Quote, to staff a proletarian class war army with officers drawn from its class enemies without first ensuring their political reliability was to ask for trouble of a most fatal kind. Ibid. At the start of the revolution, the Bolsheviks had shown tolerance to their opponents and this unfortunately allowed for the recovery of counter-revolutionary forces. Officers on parole went to aid the counter-revolution, and employers, bank staffs, and former Tsarist functionaries sabotaged production. Production declined, and some fearful peasants hoarded food. The Soviet government was surrounded in a sixth of the country's territory by May 1918. However, though they were not well equipped, eight armies were defending the new republic. Krupskaya wrote of the fledgling Red Army, Quote, At the beginning, the Red Army bore little resemblance to a conventional army. It was burning with enthusiasm, but in outward appearance it was primitive. The men had no uniforms, and each one wore the clothes he had come in. There were no definite regulations or system of rules. The enemies of the Soviet power sneered at the Red Army men, and did not believe that the Bolsheviks were capable of creating a strong, well-knit army. Unquote. Some people were even afraid of the Red Army soldiers at this point. In some ways, the Red Army was very non-traditional, which made sense given their cause and the situation. Krupskaya relayed a related story Lenin had told her. Quote, Ilyich told me of a visit which Murbach paid him. The sentry outside Ilyich's office usually sat at a little table, reading a book. In those days, no one saw anything peculiar in it. When peace with Germany was concluded and the German ambassador, Count Murbach, arrived in Russia, he paid the customary visit to the representative of the government in the Kremlin, 
the chairman of the Council of People's Commissars, Lenin. The sentry outside Ilyich's room was sitting and reading, and when Murbach approached the door, he did not even look up. Murbach glanced at him in surprise. Afterwards, on coming out, Murbach stopped next to the seated sentry, took the book he was reading, and asked his interpreter to translate the title for him. The book was a translation of Babel's Die Frau und der Socialismus. Murbach returned it to the sentry without saying a word. The Red Army men were studying hard. They realized that knowledge was needful for victory. Unquote. Lenin appreciated them, and she noted, quote, in passing down the corridor to his office with his hurried step, carrying an armful of newspapers, books, and papers, Ilyich always had a friendly greeting for the guards. He was aware of their enthusiasm, of their readiness to die for the Soviets. Pupskaya. More and more people had come to appreciate Lenin, too. Quote, the poor peasants began to look upon Lenin, of whom they had heard so much from the workers and soldiers, as their leader. Ilyich took care of the poor, but the poor also took care of Ilyich. Lydia Fotieva, Ilyich's secretary, relates how a Red Army man of a poor peasant family came to the Kremlin and cut off half of his loaf for Lenin. Quote, let him eat it, these are hungry times, he said. He did not even ask to see Ilyich, but just asked to have him pointed out to him from a distance when he passed by. Ibid. Despite his new position, Lenin lived modestly, a trend Stalin would continue in the future. In fact, Krupskaya noted, quote, Ilyich got very angry when any attempts were made to create favored living conditions for him, pay him a big salary, and so forth. I remember how angry he was over a pail of kalva, which Malkov, then commandant of the Kremlin, once brought him. Ibid. Lenin was upset when his salary was raised from 500 to 800 rubles a month and demanded to know what grounds there were for it. When he was not notified of the reason, he wrote a note reprimanding the business manager of the Council of People's Commissars. On May 22, 1918, the day before he penned that note, Lenin wrote of the food situation, quote, We observe an orgy of profiteering in grain and other food products. The famine is not due to the fact that there is no grain in Russia, but to the fact that the bourgeoisie and the rich generally are putting up a last decisive fight against the rule of the toilers, against the state of the workers, against Soviet power, on this most important and acute of issues, the issue of bread. The bourgeoisie and the rich generally, including the rural rich, the kulaks, are thwarting the grain monopoly. They are disrupting the distribution of grain undertaken by the state for the purpose and in the interests of supplying bread to the whole of the population, and in the first place to the workers, the toilers, the needy." Unquote. Cossacks on their way to meet up with white forces cut the railway line between Tsaritsyn and Moscow. Tsaritsyn was the key food transport center from the south to the north. After being appointed General Director of Food Affairs in South Russia by the Council of People's Commissars, Stalin went to Tsaritsyn. Nadezhda Aleluyeva, who he would marry the following year, and her brother, Fyodor, came with him, but did not stay long. He arrived on June 6, 1918, and what he saw was not good. He found a disorganized army with demoralized officers, and those who weren't sympathetic to the enemy considered themselves to be merely staff workers. Quote, the army command was inept, infested with supporters of the enemy, and had no conception of its task. Indeed, it had just ordered a retreat, and while the military bands were playing in the square, counter-revolutionaries were walking the streets freely. Murphy. This demonstrated why a revolutionary class war should be led by revolutionaries. On top of that, the Red Army's line had been broken, and Cossacks were close to the city, which the food supply depended on, and the food situation in Petrograd, and elsewhere, was already poor. Stalin asked the CC if he could deal with the situation. He was given authority to do so by the Revolutionary Military Council, led by Lenin. His friends Voroshilov and Orjana Kidze were also there, as was Semyon Budiani. Budiani had previously served in the Tsarist army, but was now supporting the Bolsheviks. He would also become a friend of Stalin's. Voroshilov later wrote that this, quote, group of old Bolsheviks and revolutionary workers rallied around Comrade Stalin and, in place of the helpless staff, a red, Bolshevik stronghold grew up in the south. Gray. On July 7, 1918, Lenin informed Stalin of an assassination and SR rising in Moscow via telegraph and told him that, 
Quote, it is necessary to suppress mercilessly these pitiful and hysterical adventurists who have become an instrument in the hands of the counter-revolutionaries. So, be ruthless against the left SRs and keep us informed more often. Gray. Stalin responded that, quote, everything will be done to forestall possible surprises. Be assured that our hand will not tremble. Ibid. On the same day, he urgently reported to Lenin, quote, I am hurrying to the front and riding only on business. The railway south of Saritsyn has not yet been restored. I am firing or telling off all who deserve it, and I hope we shall have it restored soon. You may rest assured that we shall spare nobody, neither ourselves nor others, and shall deliver the grain in spite of everything. If our military experts, bunglers, had not been asleep or loafing about, the line would not have been cut, and if the line is restored it will not be thanks to, but in spite of, the military. Things in Turkestan are bad. Britain is operating through Afghanistan. Give somebody, or me, special authority, military, to take urgent measures in South Russia before it is too late. Because of the bad communications between the border regions and the center, someone with broad powers is needed here on the spot so that urgent measures can be taken promptly. If you appoint someone, whoever it is, of this purpose, let us know by direct wire, and send to his credentials also by direct wire, otherwise we risk having another Murmansk." Unquote. Three days later, he had still not received a reply, so he sent another message. He objected to Trotsky handing out credentials without thinking and making appointments without consulting people there first. He said, quote, Trotsky is behaving in the way Antonov did at one time. Knock it into his head that he must make no appointments without the knowledge of the local people. Otherwise, the result will be to discredit the Soviet power." Unquote. He also stated that they needed aircraft, armored cars, and six-inch guns, or that Tsaritsyn front would be lost. Finally, he ended with, quote, For the good of the work, I need military powers. I have already written about this, but I have had no reply. Very well. In that case, I shall myself, without any formalities, dismiss army commanders and commissars who are ruining the work. The interests of the work dictate this, and, of course, not having a paper from Trotsky is not going to deter me." Unquote. In another telegram, sent the next day, July 11th, he said, quote, Everything is complicated by the fact that the headquarters staff of the North Caucasus Command has proved to be absolutely incapable of fighting against counter-revolution. It is not only that our specialists are psychologically incapable of striking a decisive blow against the counter-revolution, but also that they, as staff workers, are capable only of drafting plans and elaborating schemes of organization, but are entirely indifferent to military operations, and generally speaking, behave as though they were outsiders, guests. The military commissars could not fill the gap. I consider I have no right merely to observe this with indifference, when Kaladin's front is cut off from supplies and the north cut off from the grain district. I intend altering this and many other shortcomings in the localities. I shall take measures, even to the dismissal of those officials and commanders who are ruining the cause, despite the formal difficulties, which were necessary I shall break through. Of course, I shall take full responsibility before all the higher institutions." Murphy. In Gray's opinion, quote, Stalin's messages to Lenin were couched in forthright and even rude terms. They were, however, communications to an equal since at a time of crisis. Although he had a respect and affection for Lenin, he did not treat him with deference. Indeed, far from taking umbrage, Lenin acted promptly." Unquote. The Supreme War Council formed a War Council of the North Caucasus Military District on July 19, 1918, and Stalin was appointed its chairman. Though, on September 2nd, the Supreme War Council was dissolved, and the Revolutionary War Council of the Republic was established to take its place, with Trotsky as chairman. On September 18th, the North Caucasus Military District was reorganized as the South Front, with Stalin as the chairman of its military council, supported by Voroshilov and Sergei Menin. All three still held their other posts as well. Stalin had created a revolutionary war council in Tsaritsyn, comprised of people he chose himself, including Lazar Kaganovich and Voroshilov. Voroshilov had arrived after leading 15,000 fighting men and 35,000 non-combatant refugees over hundreds of miles to a continuous fighting in Ukraine. He had no military training, but was now put in charge of defending Tsaritsyn. 
Stalin formed a committee with Kaganovich, Voroshilov, and other reliable comrades to deal with counter-revolution. Then, he cleaned up the military and civilian institutions. A man named Nosovich, who Trotsky had appointed the chief of war direction, defected to the other side. His account of the time was published in the February 3rd, 1919 issue of the newspaper, The Surge of the Dawn. Quote, We must be fair to him, and admit that any of the old administrators have good cause to envy his energy, and it would be well for many others to learn from his capacity to adapt himself to his work and the local circumstances. Gradually, as his task became less, or rather, as his direct tasks became smaller, Stalin began to examine the work of all the administrative departments of the town, and the task of organizing the defense of Tsaritsyn in particular, and the whole of the Caucasian, so-called revolutionary, front in general. By this time the atmosphere had become heavy at Tsaritsyn. The Tsaritsyn Cheka was working at full speed. Not a day passed without plots being discovered in what had seemed to be the most reliable and secret places. All the prisons of the town were full. The local counter-revolutionary organizations also, which adopted the Constituent Assembly as their motto, had become considerably strengthened and, having obtained money from Moscow, were preparing an insurrection to help the Don Cossacks to free Tsaritsyn. Unfortunately, the leaders of this organization who had arrived from Moscow, Engineer Alexiev and his two sons, were not well acquainted with the existing state of affairs and, as a result of a badly arranged plan, which included bringing into the ranks of the active participators a Serbian battalion that had lately served the Bolsheviks in the Extraordinary Committee, the organization of this plot was discovered. Stalin's resolution was short. To be shot. Murphy. Nasevich also wrote, quote, A characteristic peculiarity of this drive was the attitude of Stalin to instructions from the center. When Trotsky, worried because of the destruction of the command administration formed by him, with much difficulty, sent a telegram concerning the necessity of leaving the staff and the war commissary on the previous footing and giving them a chance to work, Stalin wrote a categorical, most significant inscription on the telegram. To be ignored. Ibid. From the time of the February-March revolution of 1917, the former Tsar and his family were basically under house arrest, first under the provisional government and then the Soviet government. They lived fairly comfortably. At some point, Nicholas read his family, The Protocols of the Elders of Zion, an infamous fabricated anti-Semitic text. The Bolsheviks substantially cut the state subsidy for the Romanovs and placed more restrictions on them. Reactionary forces both inside and outside the country wanted the Tsar restored to power. Despite this, the Bolsheviks kept them alive, in relatively good conditions, and even prevented attempts to kill Nicholas and his family. They wanted to bring the former Tsar to trial at some point. On July 17, 1918, Nicholas II and his family were executed by firing squad in Yekaterinburg, likely because anti-Bolshevik Czech forces were close to the city. Apparently, the Presidium of the Ural Regional Soviet sent a telegram to Lenin and Sverdlov regarding their announcement of the event. It read, in part, quote, Due to the approach of the enemy to Ekaterinburg and the discovery by the Emergency Commission, Cheka, of a large White Guard conspiracy having the goal of abducting the former Tsar and his family. The documents are in our hands. In accordance with the decree of the Presidium of the Ural Region Soviet, on the night of 16th July, Nicholas Romanov was executed. Regarding this, we are issuing the following notice. Quote, In view of the approach of a counter-revolutionary band to the red capital of the Urals, and the possibility that the crowned killer might escape the people's court, a White Guard plot was discovered to abduct his family and him himself, and compromising documents have been found, which will be published. The Presidium of the Ural Region Soviet, fulfilling the will of the revolution, resolved to execute former Tsar Nicholas Romanov, guilty of uncountable bloody acts of violence against the Russian people. On the night of 16th July 1918, this sentence was carried out. Presidium of the Regional Soviet. Also in July, on the 6th, during the 5th All-Russia Congress of Soviets, the events Lenin described in that telegram to Stalin began. Left SR has killed the German ambassador, Murbach, in the German embassy, hoping to provoke war. The left SRs then attempted to take over Moscow the same day, but retreated to their headquarters when they got to Bolshoi Theater in the evening and came across Bolshevik forces on guard. They later surrendered at their headquarters. On July 7th, at 1 a.m., Lenin wrote of it to Stalin, quote, 
Today at about 3 p.m., a left socialist revolutionary killed Murbach with a bomb. This murder is obviously in the interests of the monarchists or Anglo-French capitalists. The left SRs, not wanting to surrender the assassin, arrested Zerzhinsky and Latsis and began an uprising against us. We are liquidating it mercilessly this very night, and we shall tell the people the whole truth. We are a hair's breadth from war. We have hundreds of left SRs as hostages. Everywhere it is essential to crush mercilessly these pitiful and hysterical adventurers who have become tools in the hands of the counter-revolutionaries. All who are against war will be for us. And so, be merciless against the left SRs and report more frequently." Unquote. The uprising had been supported and instigated by the leadership of the left SRs and led by a left SR who was also a member of the Cheka. It was defeated within 24 hours as it was all over by 2 p.m. on July 7th. The left SRs also attempted insurrections in other cities, but these were quickly dealt with. When the 5th Congress of Soviets came back, it decided to expel the left SRs who had supported the line of their leadership from the Soviets. The end notes from Lenin's interview with an Izvestia correspondent on the matter in his collected works noted, quote, Numerous telegrams in which the workers and peasants expressed their approval of the suppression of the revolt and their readiness to take up arms to defend Soviet power reached the Congress from all parts of the country." Unquote. In that interview, Lenin said, quote, "...revolution with remarkable consistency drives every proposition to its logical conclusion and ruthlessly exposes the utter futility and criminality of all wrong tactics." The left socialist revolutionaries, carried away by nice-sounding phrases, have for several months now been screaming, Down with the Russ peace! To arms against the Germans! We replied that under present conditions, in the present period of history, the Russian people cannot fight and do not want to fight. Closing their eyes to the facts, they continued with insane obstinacy to persist in their own line, not sensing that they were drawing further and further away from the masses of the people, and determined at all costs, even by brute force, to impose their will on these masses. The will of their central committee, which included criminal adventurers, hysterical intellectuals, and so on. And the further they drew away from the people, the more they earned the sympathies of the bourgeoisie, which was hoping to accomplish its designs by their hand. Their criminal terrorist act and revolt have fully and completely opened the eyes of the broad masses to the abyss into which the criminal tactics of the left socialist revolutionary adventurers are dragging Soviet Russia, the Russia of the people. On the day of the revolt, I myself and many other comrades had occasion to hear even the most backward sections of the people expressing their profound disgust of the left socialist revolutionaries. One simple old woman said indignantly on hearing of the assassination of Murbach, the devils, so they've driven us into war after all. It at once became perfectly clear and obvious to everybody that the socialist revolutionaries' terroristic act had brought Russia to the brink of war. That, in fact, was what the masses thought of the action of the left socialist revolutionaries. They are trying by underhand methods to embroil us in war with the Germans at a time when we cannot fight and do not want to fight. The masses will never forgive the left socialist revolutionaries for trampling so brutally on the will of the people and trying to force them into war. And if anybody was well pleased with the action of the left socialist revolutionaries and rubbed his hands with glee, it was only the white guards and the servitors of the imperialist bourgeoisie whereas the worker and peasant masses have been rallying ever closer and more solidly around the communist Bolshevik party, the authentic spokesman of the will of the masses." Unquote. The SR party was banned, and some of them continued with their terrorism. On June 20th, 1918, a Bolshevik known as V. Volodarsky had been assassinated by a member of the Central Battle Unit, a cell of the SR party. Moisai Yuritsky, who had been chief of the Cheka in Petrograd, was assassinated outside the Petrograd Cheka headquarters by an imperial military cadet on August 17, 1918. Palace Square in Petrograd was known as Yuritsky Square from 1918 to 44, and there are apparently still streets named after him today. There was even an attempt on Lenin's life in Moscow on August 30th, following a public speech. He had not taken any guard with him. He was shot and seriously injured by an SR called Fanny Kaplan. She was arrested and executed, of course. Krupskaya wrote of her experience, quote, We were having a conference on education in the building of the second Moscow State University. Two days before that, Ilyich had spoken there. 
The conference was drawing to a close, and I was making ready to go home. I had promised to give a lift to a school teacher acquaintance of mine, who lived in the Zamos Goretsky district. A Kremlin car was waiting for me outside, but the chauffeur was a stranger to me. He drove us to the Kremlin, but I told him to take our passenger home first. The chauffeur did not say anything, but on reaching the Kremlin he stopped the car and made my companion get out. I was surprised at the high-handed way he carried things, and was going to give him a piece of my mind when we drove up to our entrance in the CEC courtyard, where Gil, our chauffeur, who always drove us in the car, met me outside. He began telling me that he had driven Ilyich to the Mickelson works, and a woman there had shot at Ilyich and wounded him slightly. Obviously, he was trying to break the news to me gently. He looked very upset. Tell me, is he alive or not? I demanded. Gil said he was, and I ran inside. Our apartment was crowded. Strange-looking overcoats hung on the hall stand, and the doors were all wide open. Next to the hall stand stood Sverdlov, looking grave and grim. Glancing at him, I decided that it was all over. What are we going to do? It was all I could say. It's all been arranged with Ilyich, he said. My worst fears are confirmed, I thought. I had to pass through a small room, but it seemed an eternity to me. I entered our bedroom. Ilyich's bed had been moved into the middle of the room, and he was lying on it with a bloodless face. Seeing me, he said in a low voice after a minute's pause, You've come. You must be tired. Go and lie down. The words were irrelevant, but his eyes said something quite different. This is the end. I went out of the room so as not to upset him, and stood in the doorway so that I could see him without being seen myself. When I was in the room, I hadn't noticed who was there, but now I saw Lunacharsky in there. He had either just gone in or had been in there before. He was standing at Ilyich's bedside looking down at him with frightened, piteous eyes. Ilyich said to him, What's there to look at? At last, the surgeons arrived. Vladimir Rozanov, Mintz, and others. There was no doubt about it. Ilyich's condition was dangerous. His life hung by a thread. When Gil, together with some other comrades from the Mikkelsen works, had brought him to the Kremlin and wanted to carry him in, Ilyich would not let them. He had walked up to the second floor by himself. Blood flooded his lung. The doctors also feared a puncture of the gullet and forbade him to drink anything. He suffered from thirst. Shortly after the doctors had gone, leaving a hospital nurse with him, he asked the nurse to go out and call me in. When I came in, Ilyich was silent for a while, then said, Fetch me a glass of tea, will you? Didn't the doctors say you were not to drink anything? I answered. The trick had not worked. Ilyich shut his eyes, saying, All right, you can go. Maria Ilyinichna was busy with the doctors. I stood by the door. I went to Ilyich's private office at the end of the corridor three times during the night. Sverdlov and other comrades sat up all night there on chairs. Unquote. Needless to say, this had a big impact, even on ordinary people outside the party. Krupskaya continued, Quote, The attempt on Vladimir Ilyich upset not only all the party organizations, but the broad masses of the workers, peasants, and Red Army men. What Lenin meant for the revolution was suddenly brought home to them with special force. The press bulletins concerning his condition were followed with anxiety. On the evening of August 30th, a statement was issued by the party over Sverdlov's signature concerning the attempt on Lenin's life. It said, The working class will respond to attempts against its leaders by rallying its forces and by a ruthless mass terror against all the enemies of the revolution. The attempted assassination of Lenin made the working class close its ranks and work still harder. Unquote. And thankfully, quote, the hopes of the enemies of the Soviet government were dashed. Ilyich pulled through. The doctor's reports grew more optimistic day by day. They and everyone else who surrounded Ilyich cheered up. Ilyich cracked jokes with them. He was forbidden to move about, but on the quiet, when there was nobody in the room, he tried to sit up. He was eager to get back into harness. At last, on September 10th, Pravda reported him to be out of danger and added a note from him to the effect that he was convalescing and asked people to stop bothering the doctors with phone calls inquiring about his health. On September 16th, Ilyich was permitted to attend the Council of People's Commissars. He was so excited and nervous that he could hardly stand on getting out of bed, but he was glad to be able to get back to work at last. Unquote. When he resumed work, one of the bullets remained inside of him and he was still weak, but he had survived. 
the party was not about to let this go unanswered and followed through with what was written in the statement. Murphy claimed that, quote, the Bolsheviks answered the white terror with the red terror, and in the days immediately following the attempt on Lenin, thousands were shot for merely looking bourgeois, unquote. This is almost certainly an exaggeration, but highlights the impact of the counter-revolutionary activity and attempted assassination well. This was not the first attempt on his life. In January 1918, a Swiss communist named Fritz Platten was injured when he shielded Lenin from a bullet in Petrograd. Stalin wrote a report to Lenin on August 31st, 1918. It said, quote, Dear Comrade Lenin, the fight is on for the South and the Caspian. In order to keep all this area, and we can keep it, we need several light destroyers and a couple of submarines. Ask Artyom about the details. I implore you, break down all obstacles, and so facilitate the immediate delivery of what we request. Baku, Turkestan, and the North Caucasus will be ours, unquestionably, if our demands are immediately met. Things at the front are going well. I have no doubt that they will go even better. The Cossacks are becoming completely demoralized. Warmest greetings, my dear and beloved Ilyich. Yours, Stalin. Unquote. According to Gray, he may have been a little over-optimistic in his assessment of the Cossacks. He concluded in the way he did because it was written the day after Lenin was shot. When Lenin received the letter, he actually removed the opening and closing sections and sent it out as his own personal directive. In a telegram sent to Sverdlov from Tsaritsyn the same day, Stalin and Voroshilov wrote, quote, Having learned of the villainous attempt of the hirelings of the bourgeoisie on the life of Comrade Lenin, the world's greatest revolutionary, and the tried and tested leader and teacher of the proletariat, the military council of the North Caucasian military area, is answering this vile attempt at assassination by instituting open and systematic mass terror against the bourgeoisie and its agents. Stalin, Voroshilov, Tsaritsyn, unquote. 